Well, welcome everybody and welcome to you, Jason and Anna. It's so great to be able to focus on this topic. It's one that's very near and dear to my heart because I was the Newsweek correspondent in uh, Eastern, what, what we called Eastern Europe back then. We were referring to more and more as Central Europe. And I also covered all of the revolutions of Eastern Europe with the exception of Poland and then uh, the, uh, the overthrow in uh, the coup in Moscow. And I bring us back to that moment, 1989 through 1991, because it was a moment of great hope. We looked at Eastern Europe, at Central Europe, at the Soviet Union and the changes that were occurring there as a moment during which we felt that free markets and democracy were going to be blooming and that things were just going to be hunky-dory for the rest of uh, life. It was the end of history as some have referred to it. And um, we are now in 2019 and the topic of this evening's discussion is eroding democracies and rising nationalisms. So something has clearly happened between then and now and we are defining it as eroding democracies and so Anna why don't you maybe address what eroding democracies are? How, how do we look at them? Right. Um, so I think you know, what we first ought to realize is that these days when democracies fail and when they erode, it's not because of coups, it's not because of some kind of cancellation of elections or some traumatic movements. What we're seeing instead across the world are sort of gradual chipping away at what we think of as the basic democratic principles and institutions. Um, and this basically takes, I think there's sort of four main pillars to this. The first of this is an attack on the checks and balances that all democracies rely on in order to survive. Um, this is an attack on the courts, either politicizing courts or referring to judges as so-called judges. Um, it takes the form of attacking the press as the enemy of the people. Um, it basically takes the form of discounting um, the state and politicizing the civil service and so on. And all of this sort of chips away at the checks and balances that ought to keep governments um, transparent and monitored. Okay, so number one, chipping away chips and ba uh, checks and balances. Okay. Number two, there's, I think, a doing away with the norms, the informal norms and values of democracy. So it's a lack of um, toleration for the opposition, a lack of forbearance. Um, in Daniel Ziblatt and Steve Levitsky's terms, this is basically you know, going f much further uh, within the um, realm of the law. And so you use the law to prosecute your enemies. You don't tolerate the opposition. You dismiss the, sort of the opposition as somehow treasonous or traitorous. Um, and so it's just, you know, there's undermining and chipping away at these informal norms. Okay, so norms, out. For out. <laughs> um, third, there are elections. And here again, we don't see the cancellation of elections. What we see instead is gerrymandering, um, staffing district commissions with loyalists, changing the campaign funding laws so that the government parties are being funded much more heavily, shifting the grounds for subsidies and party registration requirements and so on so that the government parties can much more easily win elections. Um, and so again, this is not a radical transformation, it's not a revolution, it's just a chipping away at what elections ought to be, which is a fair contest between opposing political parties. Right, it's water torture. So there's a fourth <laughs> one as well. And there's a fourth one um, on this list. And that is basically eventually what this leads to, at least it has in places like Poland, Hungary, or Turkey, is basically doing away with or transforming um, the constitutions in ways that then keep these parties in power um, for the long term. Um, and that effort has, I think, gone the furthest in Hungary, where I think Jason is the expert. But we also see evidence of this in Poland and in Turkey and in other sort of eroding democracies, where you see the attempts to rewrite the formal legal institutions, again, to favor basically a permanent government by the party that initially began this process of democratic erosion. Right. So some of these uh, features, in fact, not if not all of them, are feeling mighty familiar for us, uh, but we'll get to that later. Uh, right now, we're looking at this particular phenomenon of eroding democracies. Jason, you want to jump in? Uh, sure. So, uh, you know, I agree with, uh, you know, what uh, every, basically everything that uh, Anna has said. It's also occurring here, as, as you mentioned. Yeah. Are you going to add um, something to this list of uh, uh, well, four I, things? Well, uh, uh, no, but I do want to mention a couple of things yes. uh, about it. One is that... Um, uh, the, the, the things take place in a kind of a technocratic way. And so it's, uh, the public doesn't necessarily notice it in the way that they notice coups or, or direct challenges uh, to democracy. And so, you know, no one follows gerrymandering laws uh, in most countries. And no one follows uh, detailed changes to the election laws. And so, in a way, people aren't noticing what's going on. And uh, also, many people think that the party in power uh, has a right to make these changes. Right. And what happens is 
uh, and just building on uh, Anna's last point is that uh, no one of these things is, uh, you know, dispositive, changes everything. But when you put them all together, you have what uh, a scholar at Princeton University, Kim Lane Shepla, refers to as a Franken state. Mm -hmm. So it's like all the worst practices are combined into one polity which kind of qualitatively transforms it. But in a way, it's under the noses of many people in the population. And that's what makes it so dangerous. Right, but as you say this, you know, and you talk about it happening sub rosa or out of our, uh, out of our sight, one thing that has to be factored in, I think, as we look at the 21st century is that suddenly the ability to get information, to be able to see anything is, has transformed as well, right? We are no longer in this a uh, curated structure of information that has a hierarchy of editorial delivery methods, right? We have a, a fire hose of information, a lot of noise and very little signal that's coming through. So there's a lot we're probably seeing, but not much we're noticing. And so I would layer this, although Anna has talked about the chipping away of the press, this is actually something that is beyond that, that is actually a technological change in a, in a 21st century uh, evolutionary development that prevents us from really paying attention. But I think this is exactly why the mainstream press is so important, right? This is exactly why I think there's a recognition of this. When the press gets attacked in the way that it does by would-be authoritarians, by calling it the enemy of the people, by dismissing it, by calling it fake news or lies, it's in some ways the bizarre compliment, right? This is a recognition that these are still sort of trusted news sources. And it's precisely those news sources that are being attacked. Um, you know, in, some in other countries, this takes the form of basically directing all advertising dollars to only state-owned newspapers or taking over the TV media, um, and so it's exclusively run by the government. That's not taking place here, but there is, you know, I think, an attempt to discredit precisely those sources of information that are still trusted. Right. When I was in Czechoslovakia right after the revolution in 1989, the communists were still in power because they had not had their elections yet, and one of the things that they were very effective at was they raised the price of newsprint. And so suddenly <laughs> these independent presses that were developing had no ability to actually print anything. It was just uh, out of bounds for them. Any comments on press or media? Uh, or? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I would uh, mention one other factor, which is that the economics of journalism has changed over time. And so increasingly, because they're revenue driven uh, and maybe click driven, yeah. uh, the mainstream media has uh, in some ways gone down to the level of what used to be, uh, I don't know, hard copy or, uh, you know, sensationalism. And that's just the economics uh, driving things. And I think that's part of the reason why the messages are getting drawn out. It's easier now to dismiss uh, uh, some of the, uh, if you will, the legacy media because they are sort of running with things prematurely. Right, right. Uh, and that's just the economic, you know, they have to stay in business. Yes. They need clicks. Right. So all this is happening and we're uh, unaware of it. And so that's how the press is having an effect, despite the fact that it's also a considered and concentrated effect of what these eroding democratic features of new authoritarian and oftentimes and sometimes totalitarian states are trying to do to their uh, to their polity. Can I just add one thing yeah. about that? Even when people know it, sometimes they don't care Yeah, for partisan reasons. So right. some people do know it and they say, well, uh, you know, that's OK. Right. So because you're it's my side doing it. Yes. So you're an expert in yeah. Hungary, and uh, and you've spent time there. Uh, have and I'm asking this question knowing the answer because I spent a fair amount of time in Hungary myself. I better get it right then. Uh, <laughs> yes, you better. Um, I say that because my wife used to be the U.S. ambassador to Hungary, uh, whom you also knew. Um, but maybe you can look at what's happening with the press there, for example, and how maybe. Others, everybody knows it, but it seems that some don't. Uh, well, so the, so so the press there has basically been uh, more or less completely neutered. Uh, you know, it's been a long process. Uh, some of the things that Anna was saying, uh, you know, early on uh, have been going on, and you know, more recently, you know, under kind of you know quasi mysterious circumstances, you know, the largest opposition daily, for example, closed. Nape yes. uh, You know, it was like an ownership issue. I mean, uh, you know, et cetera. It's, something was engineered. Yes. Uh, this is the hallmark of the new authoritarians is they don't just uh, go into the newspaper and arrest everybody and throw them in prison. 
that does not happen. There's almost no political violence in Hungary. You can go, you can, you can protest, uh, very little political violence. It's these more underhanded things that are then excusable that happen. And so uh, basically, if you're not an ally of, the, of uh, Prime Minister Orban in Hungary, you basically have no chance of having a functioning uh, you know, media thing, at least in terms of print media. Yeah. So the last refuge is online media, which in some sense they can't control because some things are outside of the country. Right. So th that all falls within checks and balances. We see some external forces, but you also mentioned a few other things within the checks and balances erosion, which were the judiciary. Yes. Uh, maybe you can give us some examples of what's gone on, not just in the United States, but elsewhere. Um, well, here, you know, I think Poland and Hungary are probably the most notorious examples where there's been a variety of means through which the court, entire court system is being politicized. And this ranges from suddenly replacing judges through um, an imposition of a retroactive um, retirement age. Um, it, re it, impose, it consists of imposing terms on them that have changed. It consists of packing the courts by suddenly increasing the number of judges. And of course, the new judges all happen to come from the governing party. Um, and then there's sort of you know, more outrageous examples. I think it was in Hungary where there was one person placed in, uh, in charge of all the judicial appointments. This is something that Kim Shep Elaine Shepley describes. Mm -hmm. There's one person put in charge of all the judicial appointments in Hungary. And by sheer coincidence, she happened to be the wife of the number two man in the governing party. Amazing. Um, and so she, with basically no legal expertise, followed a strictly partisan um, rubric in filling these new judiciary um, appointments. And so that's all to basically make sure that the judiciary is toothless, that it remains loyal to the government, um, that judges worry about where, whether they're going to get fired or not, and that the role as basically a key institutional constraint on what the government is doing, and as a key blockage to the further erosion of democracy, is severely constrained. There's an important difference between Hungary and Poland. Uh, because of the nature of the way uh, that Fidesz has been victorious in elections, Fidesz is the ruling party in Hungary and has been since 2010, actually all of their moves were technically legal. Yes because they had a supermajority in parliament and were able through a supermajority in parliament to make all of these changes in a procedurally legal way. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is why it's been so difficult for the EU to find a way in to criticize Hungary because uh, it was all done with exquisite, uh, mostly exquisite procedural legality. Whereas in Poland, actually the government had to break the, I mean, yes. they were in violation of the law. Yes. Uh, so it's a, a, a very, you know, Hungary in a way is a more dangerous situation yeah. uh, because they've been essentially using the tools of democracy to undermine democracy. The Polish authoritarians have all the commitments of the Hungarian ones, but half the competence. <laughs> um, and so they do break the law. Instead of you know, systematically setting up a bunch of enabling laws that make all of this legal, they simply introduce an unconstitutional law that then clearly gets criticized. Um, and they also face um, a civil society that's much more sort of used to protesting. Um, so you know, the percentage of protests in Poland has always been very high. Um, there's always people out on the streets, everything from you know, unions to angry farmers to political parties. There's a whole tradition of demonstrations. Um, and that's been, you know, it's, it's been very visible in these sort of latest would-be authoritarian episode in Poland. It hasn't done much um, to curtail what's going on with the judges. It hasn't done much to curtail with the politicization of the media or the state. The one place where it has worked was to basically prevent making an already strict abortion law positively draconian. And that's basically where you know, literally hundreds of thousands of women and men stepped out onto the streets in what, was, what became known as the Black Marches. Um, and that you know, had the odd effect of giving people a lot of hope because they realized that they could somehow constrain the government simply by stepping out into the street. Um, and that's, I think, made Polish civil society um, a much sort of rabid and much more sort of powerful force than in Hungary. In some of these countries, Russia being one of them, there are new NGO laws, you know, non-governmental organization laws preventing or at least requiring NGOs and those who work with them who are native to that nation to register. That's a problem as well. Well, I don't think the registration of NGOs yes. by itself is problematic. Um, you, you do this in the United States, right? In order to gain nonprofit status, you have to re be registered as a nonprofit entity. That's that's perfectly normal. Um, it's the basis for which you are found. You know, it's basically the thresholds and the, is the shape of these registrations. Mm -hmm. So in Russia, if you basically have any foreign involvement, you have to register as a foreign agent, right. um, and then you fall under a very different set of laws, and you can be prosecuted in ways that you can't be if you're a purely domestic organization. 
Um, and what I think is also going on is that, in, in, certainly in Russia and in other places, there's a sort of rather than the rule of law, it's the rule of it's the rule by law, where laws are specifically applied to individuals. This happened in both Poland and Hungary, where there are laws that go after people rather than after you know, sort of swathes of activities, um, and where civil society and other organizations are both retroactively and sort of normally targeted. Um, specifically to basically go after them, again, not for the kind of activities they do, but for who they are and for what they represent. So just going down your checklist, we've already hit uh, checks and balances. We've talked a bit about norms, elections, and the fact that uh, elections aren't necessarily free or fair, but they seem to be conducted. And many of those who take power are actually saying we were elected democratically. This was an open election. We competed uh, in an open field. The numbers were there for us to be elected in Hungary in a supermajority. How are the elections uh, being affected? And you suggested that at least in these two countries, but in other eroding democracies, there is a pattern. Right. Um, so I think the first p thing to notice is that most of the would-be authoritarians don't get elected with majorities. Even Fidesz only got, you know, only got over 40% of the vote, but it does not represent the majority of the people. In the United States, um, President Trump, of course, fell short in the popular vote. In Poland, PiS you know, won something less than 20% of eligible voters. So these are not majority, you know, some, they, these parties don't enjoy a huge popular mandate. And as a result, the first thing that they want to do, um, and this is oddly falls under the rubric of electoral law, is to exclude as many people as possible who aren't their supporters from voting again. Um, and so th there are all kinds of voter suppression rules that start to take place. Um, there are you know, question, you know, questioning people's citizenship, questioning their eligibility to vote, additional demands for identification, um, you know, not, delivering voting ba not delivering ballot boxes to specific areas, closing you know, um, voting precincts, and so on. And that already serves as a very useful way to limit the uh, amount of people who can vote and makes it easier for these parties to gain a, sort of a greater plurality of the vote. But in places like Hungary, they actually are getting more people to vote. They're asking their citizens in other countries to be a part of the, electro the electoral process. Uh, yes, that's true. Uh, so, um, you know, that law is an example of a law which was, so, so Fides, just to pick up on something that Anna says, is very crafty about the way it uh, formulates law. So the law looks like it's a neutral law, but it's worded in a specific way. Uh, and they worded this, uh, for, just to give you an, a concrete example, the law on, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, Hungarians living outside the country voting is that if you have a permanent residence in Hungary, you need to go to a consulate in order to vote. So these are the Hungarians that go abroad to work, which are typically liberal, and Fidesz doesn't want. Yes. The ones in London and Germany. Right. If you don't have a permanent address in Hungary, but you're Hungarian, so for example, if you live in Romania in the Habsburg successor states, uh, then you can vote by mail. Mm -hmm. And so, so this uh, you know, makes it hard for the harder for the liberals to vote and easier for the presumed conservatives um, to, you know, to vote. Right, and so Hungary. then once you have the supermajority yeah. won by non a, a, a plurality, perhaps, uh, and you are exercising a type of majoritor majoritarian government, in, yes. In fairness to Fides, that yes. Hungary's electoral law was always, uh, uh, you know, there there was always an unevenness between the proportion of the vote you get and the number of seats in parliament. Yeah. This was this is a like a a birth flaw actually of democracy because in the early 1990s when there were tons of different parties and people weren't sure that any one party was going to be big enough in order to do all the ref democratic and economic reforms, they made it so that the, the party with the most votes, the plurality party, even if it's not a majority, gets a huge boost in the parliament yes. so that they could form a coalition to then run through laws. Otherwise, you have a, you know, a chaotic uh, parliament, as actually happened in Poland in 1991, where there were 29 parties right. in the parliament. Yeah. 31. Uh, 31. Okay. <laughs> by, the by the time uh, it was all said and done. So uh, uh, actually, you know, this thing, which was thought by the people that designed the system to be a good thing, ultimately benefited Fidesz. Because in 2010, when it first broke through after the collapse of the socialists, uh, 
and the financial crisis. These two things together created a tsunami of support for Fidesz. This is what boosted Fidesz completely legal under rules they did not make into supermajority status. Right. And from there, they basically were able to change the whole system. Right. And so it's like an institutional flaw. It's like a lesson. Yes. And the idea was uh, a good one. I mean, the idea was to actually prevent paralysis and to, and to keep minority parties from really stopping anything from occurring and from being able to create uh, laws. I mean, in Greece, for example, which, you know, however you want to define it right now, uh, the, the number one party gets a 50 vote boost in a 300 member parliament. So if you come in first, right. you get whatever you get proportionally plus 50. Uh, which allows them usually to uh, be able to, to govern without necessarily having to form a coalition. Uh, again, something we don't really think about here in the United States being that we don't have a parliamentary system. We don't think about these minority members in the Congress or in Senate because it really is just two parties for the most part. Yes, go ahead. So, so let me just make a, a broader comment um, that just goes with everything that uh, has been said, which is that uh, we have to get out of our minds the way authoritarianism looked in the 20th century because 21st century, this new form of authoritarianism looks different. On the outside, it looks democratic, but on the inside, it's actually authoritarian. So it's no longer, you know, Venezuela, a strong, uh, you know, a strong man and, uh, you know, all of this kind of overt oppression. It's something very different, uh, and that's what people have to come to recognize. Right. And it's hard to recognize because I think the paradigms that we have are really fixed in what we recognize. You know, when we think about Latin America, we think about this, uh, you know, traditional sense of the strong man, uh, not think about Maduro as someone who was elected, albeit by a minority of the electorate, since most of them voted by staying home during his election. Uh, but it has all the features of a democratic system. It has the ability to uh, turn to other countries and say, you have to continue to recognize this as a sovereign state and this is the duly elected leader. These are new challenges for those of us who are looking at authoritarian states and trying to then say, well, how do we deal with this new 21st century authoritarianism? How do we deal with this new form? What are, what are the ways then to counter some of these really concerning features that you've gone through, Anna? I think the first thing would be to hold those of us who claim to be Democrats to a higher standard, right? I think it's, you know, um, I think there are, sort of th there are two different ways of doing this. One is that there ought to be sort of you know, a core group of truly democratic countries that can demonstrate that they don't do these kinds of things, where you know, the freedom of the press truly is free, where the courts are truly independent, um, where not just the sort of the letter, but the substance of the law is being observed. Um, and the EU, I think, you know, is, is both an example of a set of countries that have tried to do that for themselves, but have been singularly unable to enforce that on some of their members, as in Poland and in Hungary. So a stricter set of standards about what it means to truly be a democracy. Um, and I think secondly, you know, to give a better example, right? I think you know, it's, it's um, one of the most dispiriting things about not the Trump administration, but about the Obama administration has been its withdrawal from basically you know, the, the pivot to Asia rather than paying attention to Europe or to Latin America for that matter. The sort of, you know, sort of a pulling back and a, a lack of willingness to do what the United States has traditionally done, which is to espouse a set of liberal democratic values and expect other countries to follow them. Um, so I think those are, you know, those are very broad suggestions, but certainly those are two things that could be done. Yeah, Jason. Um, I, I'm not wholly convinced that we ought to uh, necessarily, uh, you know, intervene. Uh, so, for example, in Hungary, uh, you know, despite everything that's happened in the last eight years and all these changes, Fidesz is still by far the most popular party by a l long stretch. Yeah. Now, they don't deserve their supermajority because that's been uh, engineered, but they're still, you know, 42 percent versus the next one is 25 percent, and so. There's a way in which, uh, you know, people support these reforms. Uh, and th that brings me to my main point, which is that uh, uh, in other parts of the world, so not necessarily in Western Europe or North America, but in Eastern Europe in particular, uh, people see democracy as just another system. So, you know, in their history, you know, it's like a traditional monarchy, and then there were right-wing authoritarians, and then fascists, and then communists. And then after 1989, uh, this liberal democratic thing. 
there isn't this uh, metaphysical belief in the goodness of democracy. Mm -hmm. Democracy is a system. And if it gets us, it, it, if we prosper under democracy, we're happy with democracy. But if democracy isn't giving us what we want, we're going to opt for something else. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not 100% sure. I mean, we, we could show by example that this form of democracy works. So I'm totally in favor of that. I'm less in favor of an overt, uh, you know, kind of intervention. Uh, you know, this brings up the nationalism uh, yes. issue, which provokes a kind of, uh, you know, backlash of foreign interference. Uh, you know, this is, this is one of Viktor Orban's, the prime minister of Hungary, this is one of his talking points. It's yes. like, the Hungarians have decided to do this. Like, why is Brussels uh, foisting these things on us when we don't want it. Now, Brussels might have a reason because the EU does have rules about being a liberal democracy and respect for human rights. And so in a way, the EU does have a right, uh, uh, since Hungary is a member, to uh, you know, talk to Hungary and try and engage Hungary, et cetera, et cetera. But the broader point uh, is that it's not clear that foreigners should be telling uh, you know other people how to run their country when it's done in a democratic when it's done in a kind of a, a somewhat democratic way. Right. So, so I, I would say two things. I yeah. totally agree that intervention can backfire and backfire badly because it leads to a sort of circling of the wagons um, around the autocrat or around the the governing party. Um, I totally agree with that. But what I don't agree with is this notion that somehow people think that democracy is just another system. I think there's something different going on. I think you know what 89 shows us in the collapse of communism and the, sort of the democratic, the democratic third wave that followed, it's not that people aren't committed to democracy and don't think that it's something that's far better than the authoritarian systems they lived in, is that they have higher expectations of democracy um, than many of us do. It's not just a political system, it's supposed to also be a way of life that also brings prosperity and equality and transparency and an end to corruption. And so democracy, in, in some ways, is a victim of its own success. People have much, much higher standards of democratic regimes. Um, they remain committed to democracy, but that just means that their, their disappointment when democracy fails to live up to those standards is that much bigger. Um, and I think that's what we see in many cases you know, in Turkey and Poland and Hungary. It's a disappointment with what democracy was supposed to have brought and what it actually did bring. Right, and what Viktor Orban is arguing and others in Europe are arguing is that it's bringing us refugees and migrants and poverty and uh, loss of sovereignty and any number of other things where you have the Prime Minister of Hungary, Orban, saying, in fact, we are looking at other models. We really admire what the Turkish government is doing and what the Chinese government is doing and that they are, in fact, better models for Hungary. So where did that, how did that failure occur? In other words, you're saying, Anna, that their expectations were higher and they should have been higher, right? We, we, the United States and other Western democratic countries were selling democracy at the same time that we were combating the communist regimes. And we were saying, look, this will deliver for you in some ways that you didn't. And what they were able to do is, of course, they had some social mobility. They were able to leave their country. They were able to express themselves a bit more. But when it came to the economics, it really didn't turn out so well for the average Joe, did it? Or maybe it did. I mean, certainly Poland has had great uh, you know, uh, economic growth. But when you look at the distribution of that growth, it is, it is not the guaranteed pension and health care that they once had. It has really created an incredible disparity between the wealthy and the, and the poor within Poland and in Hungary. Sure, I think that there is greater inequality, but there's also you know massive economic growth, and there you know again public opinion um, surveys don't show people wanting to return to the previous system, sure. um, but I think what it does do is to make people very protective of what they have, and this is where I think immigration and nationalism enter the picture, mm -hmm. right? Because and this is happening not just in Poland and Hungary, but across Western Europe, um, the welfare states of Western Europe, these you know the fantastic healthcare, educational, public services, poverty relief, you know com communal swimming pools, all the services that these governments provide for their people, have really started to fray. Um, you know, this, after the, the first 30 glorious years of European expansion and growth, those came to an end. Um, stagflation and budget crunches hit. And so now, all, in all of these countries, the welfare state, as these uh, countries knew them, is increasingly under pressure. And in that situation, there's a sort of a tightening of, you know, again, the wagons around what we have. And if you have new immigrants coming into the country, what you also see is a backlash in the form of welfare chauvinism where a lot of Europeans are saying, you know what, 
I want to keep what's ours, and I don't want these weird people who want to instill sort of, you know, separate hours for separate genders in our local swimming pool to tell me what to do, take away my benefits, occupy the places you know, in the hospitals and schools. Um, and that has really sort of prompted this reaction that I think has led to a wave of populism and a wave of, sort of parties that don't necessarily support liberal democracy. If you look at Brexit, for example, you know, the highest percentage of voting for Brexit absent London occurred in areas where people were most worried about immigration, and in fact, about Polish immigration. Um, so I think there's, you know, the, the sort of the two forces are now coming together, basically, and make people very worried about what they have and what they can hold on to um, in the next decades. Right, so the Polish plumber brought about Brexit in some ways. Is that what the suggestion it's is? It's the, the Polish construction worker. Oh, he's moved from plumber <laughs> to construction worker. In England, at I, least. I, I will say uh, that you know this is the liberal part of liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. So it's not the democratic part right. uh, as much as the liberal part, uh, which I think has fa you know has failed. And yeah, can, so, can at you break that down? Because I think I you mean, know, we often we we uh, when we think about democracy, I think in in the United States we really only think about liberal democracy as opposed to this other form of democracy where we separate out the liberal. I mean, aspect. they're not you know Eastern you know uh, it's hard to generalize, but I mean they don't hold you know lots of people don't hold liberal values. They don't want people to. Uh, you know, have the freedom to, uh, you know, uh, display pornography. There, uh, you know, there's a whole range, you know, gay right. rights. So there's just the whole thing that come as part of the liberal democratic, uh, yeah. as part of the liberal package that people are just, uh, you know, lots of people are opposed to. Yeah, what I always used to think about when I uh, tried to distinguish this is I would say, well, uh, in liberal democracies, you have majority rule but minority rights. And oftentimes in the illiberal uh, democratic features, you don't necessarily have those minority rights. Certainly in Hungary, for instance, there are minorities that are um, suffering under this, uh, this regime as a result. Um, anything, but what I was going to say, you know, as you talked about the nationalism portion of this, it really expanded the criticism beyond these countries that we were talking about originally, which were the Visegrad countries, as they're known, right? The uh, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, who are, who are all part of the EU. And you started talking about Britain. And I think we can include in that Italy. And perhaps there are other countries within Europe that should be thrown into this question of how nationalism is actually rising. Who else would you throw into this, whether it's Europe or elsewhere? The United States. It's, yeah, for I mean, sure. It's, yeah. you know, this is, this is what making America great again is yeah. all about, right? I mean, populism and nationalism are fundamentally backwards looking ideologies where it's not about, you know, imagine a bright future. It's about let's go back to that idyllic and idealized past where people knew their place and, you know, the voter, the supporters of, of these kinds of ideologies had the upper hand and where we don't have to worry about, you know, these strange new people and strange new customs and strange new minority groups demanding their rights. Well, that actually, did you have something to add, Jason? Um, no. Okay. Well, then let me, let me turn to, uh, you know, I, I get a bunch of three by five cards here in, uh, from the audience, and they have questions. So I'm going to pick up, and it's perfect because what you just said about the United States. And the questioner asks, a lot of what you are talking about sounds like it is also happening in the U.S. Uh, anything we can do to stop authoritarianism here, question mark? Any differences in the situation that we can take comfort in? Um, well, so I, I would say that there are several things to take comfort in. The United States is a much older democracy than, you know, certainly Poland or Hungary. Um, and that sort of, you know, that means that the institutions have had more time to sort of figure out institutional solutions. Um, the formal institutions, if we look at the um, United States, are holding fast. Whatever we may think about Supreme Court appointments, for example, they were done entirely legally. And, you know, we may not like the partisan flavor of some of the appointees, but the, to the Trump, pres uh, the Trump um, Supreme Court appoint uh, appointees were done perfectly legal. There was no court packing. There was no sort of attempt to, you know, do away with the powers of the court or anything like that. So I think the formal institutions are holding fast and we ought to take comfort in that. The second thing we ought to take comfort in is that we are a much wealthier democracy um, than some of the ones that we've been talking about so far. Certainly wealthier than Turkey, certainly wealthier than Venezuela and others. Um, and I think the third thing that we, talk, we should sort of take comfort in is that in many ways, you know, we are also older democracies. Um, if we look at, for example, you know, the interwar period, many of the democracies that fell had much younger average populations had many more people, young people who were unemployed, had many more younger people who both had um, everything to lose in the future and everything to gain by going to the streets and supporting what would be sort of, you know, 
would be fascist movements and so on. Um, and that's not something that the United States is facing. Anything that? Uh, yeah, I'm going to be less uh, uh, comforting. Sanguine. <laughs> uh, so I, I'd like to start off by saying something which uh, some people think is controversial, maybe because of the way I phrase it. But uh, you know, Trump, uh, uh, the election of Trump was in some ways uh, uh, proves the success of democracy, and the, for the following reason. The, the, the you know the voice could be cut off, and then I'm going <laughs> to be uh, it's like bad editing. Um, uh, for the following reason, which is that um, uh, Trump got elected because the people wanted him. Uh, Trump ran against uh, not just the Democratic Party. Uh, he ran against his own party. The Republican grandees were not uh, Trumpists. And he ran against the press uh, in large part. Uh, so Trump, you know, uh, against our elites that were really trying to choose, uh, you know, determine who the president should be, uh, the political elites, Trump, uh, you know, through his bluster and all of this other kind of stuff, managed to emerge victorious because the people wanted him, the people voted for him, and they ignored uh, what everybody else was telling them about him. So, so in a way, uh, you know, this is what democracy throws up sometimes. I mean, this is the system that we have. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's often a good thing, and sometimes it's not such a good thing. Uh, so that's the first part. That's good for democracy, maybe. Like salutary, I should say, yeah. f uh, for the system. Mm -hmm. The second uh, part is I want to be much less comforting uh, because I think that uh, our institutions are not going to protect us uh, from uh, a, uh, you know, something like a new version of authoritarianism. Uh, the real problem in the United States is not the, uh, you know, the institutions are holding. So Trump did respect the Supreme Court when they pushed back on things, reworded things, resubmitted. So, so he's you know, following the rules. The real problem, and by the way, it's not a phenomenon of Trump. It's been long in the making. Obama was a serial uh, a doer of it, which is to you know, rule by executive order. So pen, it was called pen and phone uh, uh, during the Obama administration. So when he couldn't get what he wanted from Congress, like an agreement with a joint comprehensive plan of action or the player's climate. He couldn't get the Republican Senate to, so he made a personal agreement essentially uh, you know, with these countries. Now, is this democratic? Not really. Uh, you know, uh, you know, technically it was possible, but it's not in the spirit of democracy. And so it's, these, it's the breakage of norms uh, which occurred actually even before Obama, uh, you know, the getting rid of the filibuster, which, uh, you know, uh, which was uh, so both administrations are guilty of. So both parties are guilty of, uh, you know, norm breaking. And so, uh, you know, the problem is when the next Democratic administration comes in, I just think that, you know, all the stuff that Trump's doing is even over and above what Obama was doing, they're just going to like this national emergency thing. For yes. example, mm -hmm. it's like a norm. It's like you don't do that. Right. Uh, and it's already been in the press that when the next Democratic administration comes in, it's like this tool is now available. Yeah. And they're going to, you know, some people want a national emergency about climate change, and which would then give the you know, president kind of some unilateral powers, not to violate the Constitution. But the Constitution uh, doesn't, you know, allows a lot of uh, behavior uh, on the part of the executive. Right. So, so I, I think it's, uh, you know, the next sort of, uh, you know, eight years are not going to be very pleasant in this country. Right. Well, one of the uh, audience members actually talks about this uh, specifically and uh, has a comment because uh, we talk about them as norms and these democratic institutions as uh, norms that are being broken. And uh, this audience member says it's too easy. Uh, can we find another term than norm? Because it's too easy for uh, those on the right, he says. Uh, to associate it with practices that should be changed versus the heart of democracy. And so um, it, it is the question of whether or not those institutions, by dint of their being institutions, should be, in fact, uh, subject to change and uh, to uh, overthrow. Let me get to a question, uh, and this is from someone else in the audience. Having helped to develop the rule of law the past 25 years in emerging democracies in Central Europe and elsewhere in the um, uh, in the former Soviet Union, on behalf of the State Department and USAID, I would like to know if the speakers think if the United States government assistance failed, 
Did the U.S. government get any return on its investment? In Eastern Europe? Yes, I, this is specific, okay. I think, to Eastern Europe and, uh, and the former Soviet Union. I think it absolutely did. Um, I don't think there's any question about that. I think it established, it helped to establish in people's minds that what, what normalcy looks like, right? And it's absolutely the case that Fidesz is widely supported, that peace, you know, is, is governing. Peace being the labor and justice party in, in Poland. 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 Is anytime, I think it might have a new rule. Anytime you see the word justice in a political party's name, <laughs> just run, run for the hills. <laughs> um, this holds in Turkey, this holds in Poland. There, there yes. cases. Um, but I think we absolutely did get a good return on our investment because we basically sort of, you know, not just generate institutions that are still trying to function and that eventually might function again. But we also generate a whole set of expectations among the populace about what real democracy looks like. Um, and again, this comes back to, you know, this is a more expansive notion of democracy. But first of all, you know, these countries did survive as, you know, flawed, but nonetheless functioning democracies ever since 1989. I think the Hungarian situation will be harder. What will take fundamentally is the opposition to organize and to unite much more than it has, and to just act much more to convince the people. But the Polish situation isn't lost at all. Um, neither is the Czech Republic, neither is Slovakia, which surprisingly, against all odds, is you know, sort of the, the star of the Sort of the, the last few years. Um, in places like you know, Bulgaria and Romania, people are holding their governments to a different standard than they would have. Um, and they are celebrating freedoms and rights that they haven't had before. And they view this as the new normal. Yeah. Certainly that was the case in Slovakia when a journalist was killed. Absolutely. And essentially the government fell shortly thereafter because it was so outrageous. You were going to add something. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, just in, you know, uh, in crude terms, it's like, well, NATO is now at the, you know, Russian border. And so in some sense, the <laughs> yes. this happened during the Bush, you know, a Republican administration. Right. Uh, in this sense, uh, the U.S., of course, got its, uh, you know, uh, Eastern Europe has been brought into this block. Uh, the European Union also, uh, you know, flawed as it might be, you know, it's a zone of stability. Uh, it's a market for U.S. products. I think, you know, absolutely uh, the U.S. got a fantastic return on its money. Okay. It should so, not regret anything that it did. Great. And uh, so um, since we're talking in terms of returns on investment and we're looking at this in, in uh, almost financial terms, uh, the next question asks about late-stage capitalism. Hmm. And he says, it's a term currently in vogue. That term implies that capitalism has a limited life. Do you believe that? And if so, are the threats that you describe, these four stages of, uh, of uh, eroding democracies, is, uh, this, is this really just uh, capitalism's death rattle? You want me to start? Go for it. <laughs> Look, uh, no. Um, so we've been hearing about the end of capitalism for a long time. People thought that after the oil crisis, you know, in the late 1970s, everybody was talking about uh, that this is really the end and uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, so I don't buy it. Uh, I think it needs reform. Uh, and this tends to happen cyclically. So, you know, the trusts were busted in the early 20th century in the United States, you know, standard oil. So I think there needs to be reform. We haven't figured out how to deal with these... Uh, uh, you know, information technology behemoths and the influence they're having. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, government will uh, hopefully, you know, catch up and try and figure out how to, how to t tame them and regulate it in a way that, uh, you know, make th makes things function better. But, the, but there's no other system, uh, there's no other plausible system uh, except a, at root the one with, that we have. Now, can it be regulated better and improved? Absolutely. But it's not going to be the end of uh, uh, of the capitalist system. Okay, that's good. You heard it here first. Um, in anybody's <laughs> lifetime, in anybody's lifetime in this room. That's great. Uh, well, uh, you know, when it, when we do these programs, we will never be a socialist country. Okay, well, <laughs> I, it, I, that actually, I couldn't resist. That brings me to a question because it seems that you know uh, there is this question currently in American politics about socialism. And uh, there is an attempt, it seems, to try and paint uh, one of the parties as a socialist party versus the uh, one that's currently in power. Um, how does what we're looking at right now play into this? Is this whole idea of these, you know, you alluded to it earlier, Anna, with the rising nationalist question and the, the sort of make America great again is also being able to show what the opposite of that is, how to vilify either a party or those who are not great Americans. How does this, this whole idea of portraying an opposition as socialist in the United States play into this framework? 
Um, well, I think you know it's it's a it's a cheap shot. It's in the United States. It's a uniquely offensive label. Um, in most of Europe, if you were called a socialist, people would shrug their shoulders and say, "Yeah, so." Um, you know, there, there have been parties that have called themselves socialists throughout European history and functioned perfectly well in democracies and won elections and all that. So I think that you know this is sort of, sort of a uniquely American phenomenon. And if we look at sort of you know. Um, both the behavior and the ideologies of parties and compare them internationally. The American Republican Party is almost unique among other sort of you know, right of center parties in its inability to come to terms with the need for some kind of a social safety net. Um, every place else, you know, the Christian Democrats in Germany, the Christian Democrats in Italy, every place else, you know, the Conservative Party, for heaven's sake, which campaigned for Brexit on the strength of protecting the National Health Service. Yeah. Every place else, um, center-right and right-wing parties have not only made their peace with the welfare state, but actively seek to protect it and to make sure that it delivers what it's supposed to. It's only in the United States that the, sort of the center-right party, the main right-wing party, is just you know, allergic to the very idea of safety nets, of redistribution, of, doing, of regulation, of all the things that have been widely accepted by other center-right parties in the world. You know, who thought that tonight when you came out, we would be talking about capitalism, socialism, <laughs> and uh, Marxism in many ways. Life switch pageant. Yes, uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, whenever we do these programs at the World Affairs Council, invariably we talk about the biggest uh, uh, elephant in the room, which is, or you know, the biggest players on the global stage, which are China and Russia, uh, outside of the United States. And obviously many of these features that we've talked about are ones that these countries are modeling themselves on. They're looking to Russia and to China for leadership. And in fact, China and Russia often are often trying to export this model to these other countries because we never fail to talk about China and Russia. Maybe we can, we can talk about their, the unique features of their systems and how they are, if in fact they are, trying to export those features. Um, well, I think think okay. Yeah. Um, I think both would like to have more countries like them, but you know, in the same way that uh, the Polish authoritarians are half as competent as the Hungarian, the Russians are half as competent as the Chinese. Because what the Chinese are doing with Belt and Road, with sort of extensive economic investment, with foreign aid that doesn't come with democratic strings, with sort of, you know, the projection of soft power through the Confucius Institutes and whatnot, is to pursue a much more coherent and much more subtle strategy of expanding its influence. Russia, meanwhile, um, is you know, devoting itself to funding um, right-wing parties in Europe. You know, Marine Le Pen, for example, got a 9 million euro loan with no repayment date straight from Putin. Um, we just found out that the Five Star Movement um, in Italy was also funded by Putin. So it basically does things that, when discovered, look bad. Um, and that in many ways sort of signal its weakness rather than its strength. So the disinformation campaigns, the troll farm, the internet research agency, the funding of right-wing parties, and so on. These are, these are not sort of you know, part of some kind of a broader architecture that broadcasts long-term influence. These are sort of, you know, the, this is what, a, this is what a, you know, a horse fly does, right? It sort of buzzes around, it attacks where it can, it does what it can, but it fundamentally doesn't have the power to actually bring down um, democracy in quite the same way that the Chinese model can, which is much more sort of ex expansive, it's much more coherent, it's much more well thought out, and where I think there's going to be much more um, potential for long-term influence than with Russia. Right, did you have something to add? Uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, look, I, you know, I, I think China is kind of the, mo I mean, I would reverse it, although yeah. I don't disagree with what, uh, I don't disagree with what Anna said, I think they are trying to, uh, you know, exp expand their influence with countries, it's very clear in Africa and Latin America, uh, you know, very prominent. You know, I think every would-be dictator in the world uh, looks at China and says, this is the formula for modernity uh, that's consistent with a dictatorship, what's consistent with me staying in power. Uh, uh, you know, that was always the problem. You could be a dictator, but you couldn't get the hyper-modern, uh, high-tech thing because uh, you would lose control. And so somehow China is doing this. So all the dictators are looking and saying, how can we figure out how to do this? I I'm not sure uh, China, with its 1.1 billion people, is a, you know, a model for places like Zimbabwe, you know, poor countries. Uh, it isn't clear that other dictators can actually do yeah. uh, what the Chinese are doing, uh, but I think they're definitely seen as an alternative model and they portray themselves as an a alternative model, a kind of a state capital, you know, it's like a state capitalist uh, model. Uh, as far as them being, uh, you know, I, I don't think either China 
neither China nor Russia for the regular people in other countries are, uh, uh, are even remotely attractive as models, particularly Russia, which is basically just an authoritarian uh, regime. But even China, because China is a mercantile country, uh, China isn't selling an idea. Uh, as bad as the Soviet Union was uh, back in the day, it was selling the idea of equality. And this is why millions of people all over the world, uh, you know, uh, an end to exploitation. Now, it might have been uh, overblown and uh, difficult and uh, not the reality, but this was an idea that people bought into by the millions uh, in the 20th century. Uh, and this, like, this ideology was like the basis of a, competi of a worldwide competition for influence. Today, China doesn't have an idea. It's, uh, it's a mercantile uh, society that's buying influence, just like Russia. It's not sell there, there's no idea that appeals to ordinary people from either of these countries. Right. But their money certainly appeals to their other money appeals. countries. But this is, as long as the money keeps going, but yes. then when the money stops. Right. Right. Then they so have does to the Well, so does the support. Right. Yeah. Are there, you know, there are parts of the world that maybe are not experiencing this type of rising nationalism, eroding democratic. I, I, and I've had this from a colleague of ours, Corey Shockey, saying that when you look at Latin America, there's actually a better story to tell. Um, Is that the case? Or was she? Uh, Venezuela suggests otherwise. Yes. <laughs> but no. I think there's a, there's a different story to tell in the following sense, that what we see in Latin America is a very different popular reaction, a very different form of populism. Um, so what we don't see is this sort of you know, right-wing nativism that we see all across Western Europe taking root um, and basically wanting to exclude certain groups, wanting to marginalize others, and wanting a very narrow definition of who the people are. What we see in Latin America, and that's traditionally been the case, is a much more left-wing sort of um, uh, populism, which is much more redistributive and has a much broader nation of, uh, notion of who the people are. Um, and so rather than excluding, it's a much more inclusive set of populist movements. Um, and some of their commitment to democracy is questionable. Um, certainly, you know, in places like Bolivia, Ecuador, um, Venezuela, you know, things have not always ended well. But these are never sort of, you know, the kind of nativist um, movements that want to exclude groups from the body politic. Um, and so in that sense, I think that's a, that's a huge difference between Latin America and Europe, for example. Yeah, I would totally uh, agree with that. And it, it's part because the populations themselves are very, uh, you know, diverse to begin with. Uh, it's, there are no native, uh, you know, in Europe you have the, you know, native white people and then you have immigrants. But in Latin America, in some sense, everybody's uh, an immigrant and you have indigenous people. So they have a different historical background. I will say that Bolsonaro is kind of, in Brazil, is, uh, you know, more in the Trumpian uh, mode and, uh, you know, also yeah. in uh, the Philippines. They have a similar kind of a democratically elected person. But, uh, uh, yes, I, I would agree with the claim that uh, Latin America is, is doing better, uh, you know, with democracy right now than other places. Right. So, and we'll see, of course, as and, we're recording this. Yes. And, and I think it's in part because uh, the perception is that democracy is more responsive to the people right. in those countries countries so it can deliver and this well is it's responsive to people's yeah. preferences in a way that uh, I think people in Europe and certainly uh, in the US feel that uh, that the government is less responsive to people's needs in other words that the elite decides things uh, over and above uh, you know what people actually want that's the perception yeah I actually think this yeah. is critical. I think you know, what's, what's really driven populism in Europe, for example, is this notion that the elites are totally corrupt and unresponsive to the people. In fact, that's the main claim that populism makes, right? Is, you know, there are these horrible elites. And when you look at, for example, in Eastern Europe, what's been happening, you know, first, there was the consensus around the necessity for market reforms. Then there was the, the consensus among elites for the necessity to join NATO and to join the European Union. Um, in Western Europe, you have this general notion that the elites have sold out and rather than representing the people, basically do whatever the EU tells them to do and that, you know, Junkers rather than national governments actually govern the countries. And that, I think there's a profound sort of, you know, sense of frustration with democratic elites and representatives that don't actually respond or seem to care about their voters and their supporters. Um, and in Latin America, that's just not the case, right? It, it's not a question of so much delivering on promises mm -hmm. as much as it is much more of a sense of being listened to and actually being responded to rather than just being talked over. Right. But you can be authoritarian and be responsive. I mean, when you think about 
well, Victor so Orban, for instance, I mean, he has, to some degree, delivered uh, or been responsive to the calls of the people. And unfortunately, I think what we we're saying also is that nationalism is also a form of responsiveness to a populace that is tired of some of the daily uh, trials and tribulations that they're facing, or at least perceiving themselves of facing with, uh, whether it's immigration or other problems. Is that a fair argument? What I would say is that, you know, that what populist parties, right-wing populist parties in Europe have capitalized on is precisely this sense of frustration that the elites aren't representing us, right? And so they say the things that the elites won't. They criticize immigrants. They criticize the European Union. They criticize, in some cases, NATO. They say that, you know, why, why in the world can't we say the things that we want to say rather than sort of engage in some kind of political correctness? Um, and so they capitalize on this sense of frustration of lack of representation and basically say and do the things that the elites won't, including Including, question democ uh, including questioning democracy, questioning the rights of immigrants, um, and so on. But right. that's seen as more genuine and authentic than what the elites have been delivering so far. Right. And just with regarding immigration, I mean, these countries you know, are, are not immigrant societies. They're not used to uh, having immigrants. Uh, they have their ways. And the, and the, 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 politici the, you know, the right-wing populist politicians have brilliantly capitalized on this, I mean, it's a, it's in some ways a cynical, uh, because we're not talking about large numbers of immigrants in these countries. I mean, the EU is like a thousand, you know, like two thousand in Poland and one thousand in Hungary or something. Yes. Like that. It's a very small number of people, but they've capitalized uh, very cleverly on this. And you know, Viktor Orbán, the Prime Minister of Hungary, you know, cynical as he is, actually did. He was the first one to build walls to yes. keep immigrants out. He was the leader of the uh, wall builders. And ultimately, quietly, sotto voce let in uh, immigrants. Yes. Like in a deal, but it didn't pu didn't publicize it. Right. But ultimately, let it in. So it was never about uh, you know letting several hundred people in. It was all about uh, using this in order to increase his own position. Yeah, and it's also a very contemporary issue. I mean, one that is fed by these wars in the Middle East that is actually putting a lot of pressure. I, I mentioned this because I, I used to live in Germany and in 1988, I remember being in Helmut, Chancellor Helmut Kohl's office and him saying, wir sind, ein kein, wir sind kein Einwanderland, we are not an immigrant nation. And he would be outraged by the idea that there would be immigrants and uh, that would move and live permanently in Germany. So it is an evolutionary process, one fed by the current uh, a and, moment. And I think the, you know, the, sort of the interesting aspect to this is that the current wave of immigration is also different from previous waves, right? Mm -hmm. Where you had basically immigrant workers coming in, bringing over their families, establishing sort of, you know, their own family life and whatnot. The big fear about immigrants is you know, the image we have, our families of refugees making this incredibly perilous journey across the Mediterranean. The favorite thing for the populace to point out is that 75% of the immigrants are young single men. Yeah. And what's left, of course, in some cases, you know, I mean, there have been some absolutely vicious newspaper articles and images, is that this basically means that they will marry our women, they will rape our women, they will attack our women, right? And they will sort of, you know, change the demographic profile of our nations. Um, and so there's sort of this very strange component of a fear of, you know, these young uh, male immigrants coming in and changing the shape of these countries. These um, are very powerful, very emotional, they're visceral. fearful, visceral issues. And I can see why any uh, leader or any political party or leader would be able to capitalize on these. So w one thing that has not been mentioned, which uh, you know, basically picks up on something that Anna said, is that one thing uh, that no one is allowed to question uh, is, are the virtues of diversity. Mm -hmm. which is also partially true also in this country, but yes. it's certainly true in Europe. Mm -hmm. And this is one thing that people do want to question. Like, right. is diversity, you know, is it really our strength? Uh, we can ask it here, uh, uh, but they definitely ask it there. It's like, you know, looking down the line, uh, is this really going to make us stronger? Uh, do we need to be a multicultural? Because down the line, you become a multicultural country, and not everybody is, not everybody wants that to happen. Yes, I mean, we see that certainly in France, which we still yep. put cool. into the democratic category uh, and perhaps even uh, non-eroding democratic side of the equation. And here, you know, there's a purely economic argument to be made, right? These are aging populations and shrinking populations. And without massive immigration, you basically are going to have the shrinking of these economies. Um, you know, the same applies to Japan, for example. That argument buys you absolutely nothing. 
um, right. whether in Japan or places else, because it's not about the economics. It is fundamentally about national identity and wanting to feel like you have your own home. Um, that's pretty narrowly defined. And it's also not an immediate threat. I mean, even though the welfare state itself will be under threat Fair because enough. there will no there will be no workers to support the aging populations, um, it is something that's down the road and that you can certainly kick the can down right on, as opposed to someone who's in the streets today. Right. Yeah. Well, um, you know, uh, given – so do you think – let me – before I ask a, a final question from the audience here, do you think then that that is the defining issue for why we are – you know, facing these eroding democracies in Europe, because it's not the case in China or Russia. The, the immigration is not what's forcing the erosion of democratic norms. But there were no democratic norms here to start off yes. with. Yes, that's not <laughs> true in Russia, actually. Yeah, let's, well, there's a brief there tenure works. interlude, yeah. but... Right, so China. But let's talk about Russia for a moment, because they really were heading in the right direction for a moment. No, yeah, so Anna disagrees. Uh, uh, you know, arguably, you know, when Putin first came to power in 2000, basically, 1999 and 2000, uh, you know, it was more democratic. Uh, and this actually shows the evolution of these regimes. Yes. I mean, Putin is the ghost of, uh, you know, Christmas future for places, uh, you know, like Hungary and, uh, you know, uh, maybe even Poland, where, you know, over time, uh, you know, no one considers Putin democratic. I mean, no one considers this country a democracy. It was sort of a democracy uh, in the early Putin years. Yeah, Putin Medvedev, yes. Yeah. It, it was sort of a democracy, but remember what that democracy was like. You know, the Yeltsin years from 1990 until 2000 were chaos. Crime was on the rise. Um, you know, there was no, you know, the infrastructure was falling apart. Um, the Russian military might was showing itself to basically be toothless over and over again and crumbling. Um, and above all, the standard of living for most people was plummeting. I mean, people were bartering on the street. You know, people were not being paid their salaries. You know, their arrears everywhere. And so what democracy meant for most Russians is basically chaos. It's chaos and a plunging um, set of, of life standards. And so then when Putin comes around and basically says that he'll manage democracy better, and that's exactly what he promises, it'll be sovereign managed democracy, that proves incredibly compelling. He raises the standard of living largely because oil prices go up, mm -hmm. um, and he delivers in ways that democracy didn't. So I don't think, you know, I think you know, Putin is less about you know, the erosion of, of democracy than it is about democracy having failed to deliver in the first place um, in Russia. Okay. Yeah. Can I just make one yes. historical point here, which is that uh, we've had all these debates before. I mean, we. Uh, the, these debates have occurred before, and they were in the 1920s. Yes. <laughs> When people were not convinced that liberal democracy, you know, liberal democracy competed with the communist movement and actually with fascism, this is pre-war, right. uh, competed uh, with each other for sort of, you know, who can organize society and be more productive. Right. These debates occurred also in the 1920s right. among elites. Which leads me to the final question from our audience, which is, what is an ideal form of, them, of democracy that that, quote, truly democratic nations should be exemplifying. And I think that was asked with, in all sincerity. The best we've done is liberal democracy. Majority rights, so majority rule, minority rights, the protection of fundamental freedoms, like the freedom of speech, the freedom of association, and so on. Um, is it perfect? No. Um, well, does it always fail? Of course it does and not fail. But is it flawed? Of course it is, because we're all flawed. But I think that's the best we can do. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, in broad terms, I don't disagree. Given the flaws that people have, uh, I don't think you can manage much, uh, you, know, uh, you know, much better than that. I mean, uh, you know, maybe with a different uh, kind of set of rules that maybe uh, strive for greater levels of equality, so more redistribution, uh, you know, would be desirable. Uh, you know, how, the, the question is how you get that in a democratic way. Maybe make dignity a yes. democratic principle, right? Like, you know, so the dignity of, you know, well, why not, right? I mean, if we think, you know, if we are equal before law, if, we, if our votes should count equally, then shouldn't we also, you know, that presupposes some kind of a dignity given to each human being as a political actor. So why not, you know, expand that to include some kind of, you know, economic, basically, safety net that allows people to live dignified lives? It's yeah. liberal democracy. It's a noble experiment, uh, one that's a uh, work in progress. And we have one more uh, Just a question on Jason. dignity. Yes. So I totally agree with uh, Anna. And I would just add that uh, 
which we haven't talked about yet, which is the Arab Spring in uh, you know 2011. And when you look closely at the messages that the people wanted, it actually was not democracy, it was dignity. If you look at the rhetoric, uh, there was some democratic rhetoric, but what the people wanted, they didn't talk about democracy, they talked about dignity. So that's mm -hmm. a great way to wrap up this recorded portion of this evening, which is let's focus on dignity, perhaps a right, certainly something to fight for. In liberal democracies, which we do consider an ongoing experiment that requires the people to show up and participate, um, something we're all working on and something that you tonight have participated in with your uh, presence. Um, let's go forth and uh, see if we can uh, set the world on fire. <laughs> you shouldn't say that in California. <laughs> yes.